हेलो स्टूडेंट्स वेलकम टू ईपीजी पाठशाला आई एम डॉक्टर राजीव जैन फ्रॉम जिवाजी यूनिवर्सिटी ग्वालियर टुडे वी आर गोइंग टू डिस्कस अबाउट ए मॉड्यूल कैलिब्रेशन ऑफ ग्लास वेयर एंड इंस्ट्रूमेंट अंडर पेपर फंडामेंटल्स ऑफ अनलैटिकल केमिस्ट्री इन दिस मॉड्यूल लर्निंग ऑब्जेक्टिव विल बी वाट इज द बेसिक टर्मिनोलॉजी यूज फॉर कैलिब्रेशन calibration as a comparison exercise for physical quantities factors contributing to quality of calibration different modes of calibration calibration of glassware cal uh, calibration of some widely used instruments all these things we will study here in this module so calibration is usually made by comparing it with some standard some standard weight should be there if i want to weigh uh, i want to take out 1 gram of weight is given to me and i want to know whether it is actually 1 gram or not how i will calibrate it means i will compare it with the standard 1 gram weight of the substance and then if my weight given to me is 1 gram as per the standard then i will say that i have calibrated it similarly if i take a i have been given a pipette which is its capacity is 20 ml volume then i want to calibrate it whether it is actual 20 ml or not then i should be given another pipette which is a standard one which has been assumed as standard which contains exactly 20 ml of water and if my weight which has been given to me contains only 19 not 20 but 19 ml of water it means i have to calibrate that i have to weigh it in such a way i have to change the mark the mark is to be placed at a place where it contains 20 ml of water it means calibration and comparison is one and the same thing calibration calibration may be taken as comparison it is comparison with the standard most measurements become useful only through comparisons a, a measured value by itself cannot usually be interpreted without a reference point we cannot say without reference that a given substance is 1 g or 2 g there should be some reference which is of a standard value that it is 1 g then we can say our substance by reference to that standard is 1 g moreover the raw data in most chemical measurement are recorded in units of potential difference for example volts v or currents amperes a that can be actuated by many different phenomena not necessarily the quantity we need to measure such a quantity is technically called as measurement in analytical chemistry the term analyte is also commonly used if one refers to a certain chemical species such as an element ion molecule or radical which is to be analyzed is called as analyte before an elect electrical signal becomes readily understood and interpretable it is compared with a similar one recorded under identical experimental conditions but on a sample with well defined values of the measurement such a sample with known properties regarding quality under investigation is called a standard the higher the signal in the measurement of the standard the higher is the expected signal in the measurement of the same property on a sample with a known value of measurement the signal can increase or decrease with increasing value of the measurement as shown in figure 1 in the first case increasing signal with increasing value of the measurement and a larger signal in the standard than in the unknown relates to a smaller value of the measurement in the unknown for signals showing the reverse behavior 
smaller signals with increasing value of the measurement, a smaller signal in the unknown relative to the signal from the standard point to a higher value of the measurement in the known sample. This dependence of the signal on the value of the measurement can be utilized for the quantification of this measurement. If the signal depends also on the concomitant species, these are regarded as interference, and if not properly dealt with, this secondary dependence can lead to inaccurate measurement. There is also a similar type of comparison useful for identification of chemical species as shown in Figure 2. In Figure 2, two di different energy calibrations for the same measurement. On the left, the calibration factor is 1 cm per degree. On the right, the calibration factor is 2 cm per degree. This type of calibration is automated and is unnoticed by the operators in many modern instruments so that the reliability of the operation is increased. In order to identify a species, one frequently resorts to spectroscopy measurements where one measures a spectrum of as a function of wavelength or wave number. The property of interest in these cases is not only the size of the signal but also the wavelength axis. It, the, the, to pinpoint a certain wavelength, for example, 280 nanometer along with the wavelength axis, it is useful to have a standard one or more distinct features around this wavelength. If a, if a feature expected at 250 nanometer shows up at the wavelength of 275 nanometer, then the wavelength scale can be adjusted or calibrated by a factor of 1 is to 1 to give the true physical wavelength. Such a comparison of a wavelength scale is also required for electrical measurements, for example, potential, current, but this calibration can often be taken for granted if the measuring instruments are properly attended. In liquid chromatography, there is the need to calibrate the time axis in, in terms of the eluent stream in order to facilitate the correlation between elution times and chemical substances. So at every stage, it is the comparison. Calibration is comparison. Here, we concern ourselves mainly with the quantitative measurement of chemical species and the role of calibration in this process. One calibrates the reading of a measurement system in order to give it a quantitative interpretation. Quality of calibration. No quantitative measurement can therefore be better than the intrinsic quality of the comparison process called calibration and there is a couple of ways to improve this comparison process as shall be seen in the, my later lecture. One factor is the repeatability of the measurement itself. Process it should be repeatable. It should be reproducible. Suppose the measurement gives highly variable readings. It will then tend to do, it will then tend to do so both for standard and the unknown. The signal size is therefore poorly defined, leading to poor predictions of the measurement. In, in uh, the signal size is therefore poorly defined, leading to poor predictions of the measurement. In practice, the variability for the standards may be different than the variability of the measurement of the sample. Thus, the latter is limiting the quality of calibration. The other factor relates to the value of the measurement. In the standard is shown in the figure, some calibration are limited by poor repeatability that leads to a highly variable relation between concentration, amount, and signal. The value assigned to a standard usually carries a smaller uncertainty if the standard is produced from pure chemicals with well defined stoichiometry. It has a Larger uncertainty 
if the standard is a reference material with a matrix similar to the sample. This does not need to be disadvantaged as the calibration is then particularly relevant to the problem and one needs to worry less about matrix effects. The final factor limiting the quality of calibration and in many real life analytical system, the overwhelming one is the validity of comparison itself. In calibrating an instrument, one must be reasonably sure that the instrument will respond to the measurement in the standard in the same way it does to the measurement in a different environment, the unknown. The physical differences between sample and standard also frequently hamper the calibration while invalidating the comparison process. This problem is considerably more likely to occur if calibration is based on measurements of standards prepared from chemicals of high purity and advantages can be expected from the use of in-type standard reference materials for calibration if available. Which particular physical properties can affect the results and need to be identical in the standards and unknowns depends on the principle of the measurement and the physical state of the sample. Among them are temperature, pressure, viscosity, turbidity, particle size, surface, roughness and thickness are important. Differences in response can also be caused by commitments and the measurement is then said to be of insufficient selectivity. Differences could also be traced to contamination or loss whereby a higher or lower signal might be obtained. The judgment regarding the validity of a comparison is one of the most difficult aspects of analytical work and can ultimately only be done by checking the accuracy of results on reference material. Alternatively, results obtained on several samples by procedure A compared with the results obtained by another procedure B that is based on a completely different measuring principle can show the accuracy of the data. For instance, it might be possible to assess the accuracy of spectrophotometric determination of phosphate by one based on ion chromatography. Figure 5 shows such a comparison. The tighter the points lie to the line, the closer the slope to unity, and the smaller the intercept, the better the correspondence between the two methods. The validity in this figure 5, the validity of a calibration can be assessed by a method comparison exercise if both procedures are based either on independent principles or on measurement on standard reference materials where reliable values of the measure of the measurement are available as true value. The validity is the ultimate and crucial property in any calibration that limits its usefulness. The curve is commonly called as a recovery function curve. Frequency of calibration and recalibration. Although great efforts are being made to produce analytical instruments that give stable readings over time, the long-term stability is usually limited. This is partly the reason for the importance of calibration in practice. While for an analytical balance, it might be sufficient to calibrate it once every two months. Most chemical instrument measurements are calibrated daily or even more frequently than that. In this way, chemists attempt to reduce the day-to-day -day variability of their measurements as much as possible. Thus, on each working day, every chemist in the world produces his or her own scale that may or may not be significantly different from all others. Measurements that are evaluated by comparison with those made on standards are called relative methods. Absolute methods can be evaluated without comparative measurement, but they rely instead on fundamental physical and chemical constants. And principles. In case of various electrochemical measurements, certain electrochemical measurements rely on definite oxidation state of chemical substance before and after measurement, and therefore, 
transferred charge is directly convertible to amount of substance. Volumetric measurements rely on presence of well-defined chemical species. The knowledge of the particular reaction, equation, and of atomic masses is therefore sufficient for the quantitation of the measurement. In these instances, no, no calibration for the actual measuring step is necessary, provided the titrant is available in high purity. In practice, very few procedures are operated completely without standards another com com uh, another complication for such absolute methods is the fact that the actual measurement is done in terms of volume as you can see here in figure therefore in spite of validity of fundamental stoichiometry relation actual volume is calibrated by comparison with result of measurement of the standards as titrations shown in figure 6, titrations are based on the amount of substances in stoichiometric relations to each other. They can therefore be regarded as absolute method. This is however only true for amounts. If volumes are measured, the relation is calibrated by tighter factors that vary from day to day. An example is the titration of a strong acid with a strong base, sodium hydroxide. Sodium hydroxide solution is made up to have a molarity of 1.0 mole per liter. Instead of relying on the dilution process, a measurement is done on a very well defined amount of strong acid, for example, nitric acid. If 0.01 mole nitric acid is taken, one expects a volumetric consumption of annual solution of 10 ml instead of 10.3 ml consumed and the relation between the volume of titrate and the amount of acid adjusted by the factor 1.03. This proportional adjustment corresponds to the construction of a separate calibration function for this particular batch of titrate using a single standard. It is necessary only because in practice the volume of the basic solution is measured instead of the amount of base and so does not invalidate the fundamental stoichiometric equation underlying the, this volumetric measurement. The standard less procedure also often relates to relative methods that do not require calibration by the operator in the laboratory or in the field. Generally, these procedures are characterized by a fairly stable relationship between the measurement and the instrumental response leading to a great intervals between calibration. In the extreme, the calibration might be valid for the lifetime of an instrument and therefore carried out prior to shipping in the factory. If this is possible, it is a great convenience for the chemist. But the responsibility for adequate calibration rests rest still with him. It is therefore wise to check regularly whether the system operates according to the same response characteristics or not. The sequence of experimental steps in calibration are summarized in Figure 7. Obtain or prepare standards, first step, measure standards, derive calibration model. Measure unknowns, apply calibration model to data from unknowns, recalibrate regularly. This is the general flow chart of calibration which should be followed by the chemist regularly and not rely on the instrument performance. Calibration protocol and calibration models. The simplest calibration is one that utilizes only one standard. One may be forced into such a protocol when only one sufficiently reliable standard is available. In this instance, it is supposed that for a zero measurement, the analytical system give, analytical system gives zero response. Between these two values at intermediate mass of the analyte, one resorts to a linear interpolation. The corresponding model for measuring concentration is signal is equal to constant into concentration. The constant 
B1 is called the sensitivity and can be regarded as proportionality constant between the signal and the measurement. This proportionality is usually valid over a restricted range of values of the measurement. The region of validity of B2 is called the working range of the N analytical system. At higher values of the measurement, the curve tends often to be to bend towards the x-axis as long as there is noticeable change in signal as the concentration changes one operates within the dynamic range of the method although the sensitivity decreases continuously for such a bent curve if response at zero concentration is no, not known it is measured in course of calibration a measurable signal at zero concentration of analyte is either due to due to contamination of sample or due to inadequate recovery of net signals from background or both simplest model for this two point calibration is signal is equal to blank plus constant into concentration as shown in the figure 2 as shown in equation 2 b0 thus indicates the magnitude of the blank whereas b is again a measure of sensitivity for a cantilever dependence of signals from measure and other models must be employed such as the gradient model signal is equal to blank blank plus constant into concentration plus constant given in the following equation the more involved the model the greater the required the greater the required number of standards Another reason for using large number of standards is in multivariate calibration when more than one analyte is considered is considered simultaneously or corrections of signal for contribution of concomitant species are applied as shown in equation 3. This not only requires the use of multiple standards but also the knowledge of the concentrations of all species contributing to the signal in any of the standards. In mathematical terms, the simplest model involving k species corresponds to as given in equation 4, y is equal to b0 plus b1 c1 plus b2 c2 plus b2 c2 and so on and it goes to bk ck. But much more involved ones, hyperbolic and sigmoid are also in use. For instance, in X-ray fluorescence spectrometry, it is not uncommon to measure 30 to 60 standards. A good strategy in calibration is to use only as parasimonious a model as possible and to test for the most parasimonious model consistent with the data by a formal statistical testing procedure, thereby avoiding any overfitting of the experimental result. Once the calibration models are derived by one of the methods presented, they are employed to predict the measurement in a sample other than a standard. In order to do so, the models need to be reformulated in terms of their inverse. These inverse functions are called analytical models. Such an analytical model is given in equation 5. For equation 2, the analytical model is given in equation 6. Analytical models for the more complicated calibration models are either obtained by algebraic method or equally important by numerical approach in an iterative manner, in an systematic manner. Calibration modes and protocols. While calibration is generally practiced in analytical laboratory, the exact mode of operation varies depending on the analytical method. In some methods, it is enough to measure a single standard. This is called single point calibration. Sometimes a two point calibration is practiced. One is a standard at a low concentration value, another is at a high concentration value. The two are chosen to bracket the values of the unknown. The lower one might be the blank value. These protocols are all versions of a calibration mode that is called external calibration because the samples containing the unknown amount 
and the standards containing the known amount are separate throughout. In addition to the external calibration, some other modes are also important. Internal calibration, standard addition method, and isotope dilution technique. If prior to the determination, a fixed amount of a different but similar substance is added to the sample, this substance is called the internal standard and the mode of operation is called the internal calibration. The addition serves the purpose of controlling a critical step that would otherwise introduce a large amount of large element of uncertainty. Therefore, it is wise to add the surrogate substances as early as possible in the analytical procedure. Care has to be taken, however, that the added substance is well mixed with the sample and is in a physical state and binding state comparable with that of the measurement. The assumption in the internal standard mode is that the measurement shows the same behavior in all the critical steps. Thus, the ratio between the data of the measurement and the surrogate substance constitute more reliable information than the data of the measurement itself. A reliable mode is the method of standard addition since one uses the measurement itself for internal calibration. In order to do so, the sample is split into several subsamples before the analysis. One subsample is treated as usual while one adds increasing amounts of the measurement to the other subsamples. The analytical determination is then carried out on all subsamples and the resulting data is plotted as shown in figure 8. In this figure, it is very clear that standard additions for lead in a water supply reservoir by graphite furnace atomic absorption. Three aliquots were spiked with 0, 10, and 20, 20 nanogram per ml, respectively, and measured in duplicate. The resulting concentration value is. 11.5 nanogram per ml. It is equally important to be alert to the assumptions that need to be fulfilled if this mode should lead to success. One of them is that the curve has to be strictly linear even in the lower range where due to the presence of the measurement in the sample one cannot produce data per, but extrapolates to zero. Another crucial assumption Particularly in trace analysis, is that there is no appreciable blank in the sample, for it is impossible to test this fact experimentally. The most advanced form of internal standardization is the isotopic dilution mode. Here, one opts for a spike that is chemically speaking more similar to the measurement, yet still discernible for the original one. It is the identical chemical substance but with at least one atom in the structure replaced by another isotope. Frequently, one replaces a hydrogen by a deuterium atom or a 12 carbon by a 13 carbon in an organic substance. If only ions or atoms are determined, then one adds a known amount of the ion atom in different isotopic abundances so that the isotopic ratio of the sample is altered. The more of the measurement originally present, then the smaller the resulting overall change. For this technique, an isotopically selective detector is required so that in practice the detection is generally done by mass spectrometry. The technique is then termed isotope dilution mass spectrometry to highlight the essential feature of this operation. Next is calibration of glass glassware. For most analytical purposes, Volumetric apparatus manufactured to class A standard will prove to be satisfactory, but for work of the highest accuracy, it is advisable to calibrate all apparatus for which a recent test certificate is unavailable. The calibration procedure involves determination of the weight of water contained in or delivered by the particular piece of apparatus. The temperature of the water is observed and from the known density of water at that temperature, the volume of water can be calculated. It is suggested that the data given in the table be plotted on a graph so that the volume of 1 gram of water at the exact temperature at which the calibration was performed can be ascertained. In all calibration operations, 
the apparatus to be calibrated must be carefully cleaned and allowed to stand adjacent to the balance which is to be applied toge together with the supply of distilled or deionized water so that they assume the temperature of the room. Flask will also need to be dried and this can be accomplished by rinsing twice with a little acetone and then blowing a current of air through the flask to remove the acetone. After allowing the clean dry, dry flask to stand in the balance room for an hour, it is stoppered and weighed. A smaller filter funnel, the stem of which has been drawn out so that it reaches below the graduation mark of the flask is then inserted into the neck and deionized water which has been standing in the balance room for an hour is added slowly until the mark is reached. The funnel is then carefully removed, taking care not to wet the neck of the flask above the mark and then using a dropping tube, water is added dropwise until the meniscus stands on the graduation mark. The stopper is replaced, the flask reweighed and the temperature of the water noted. The true volume of the water filling the flask to the graduation mark can be calculated with the aid of data given in the literature. Repeat. Repeat is filled with the, with the distilled water which has been standing in the balance room for at least an hour to a short distance above the mark. Water is run out until the meniscus is exactly on the mark and the outflow is then stopped. The drop adhering to the jet is removed by bringing the surface of some water contained in a beaker in contact with the jet and then removing it without jerking. The pipette is then allowed to discharge into a clean, weighed, stoppered flask and held so that the jet of the pipette is in contact with the side of the vessel. The pipette is allowed to drain for 15 seconds after the outflow has ceased the jet is still being in contact with the side of the vessel. At the end of the draining time, the receiving vessel is removed from contact with the tip of the pipette, thus removing any drop adhering to the outside of the pipette and ensuring that the drop remaining in the end is always of the same size. To determine the extent at which the outflow ceases, the motion of the water surface down the delivery tube of the pipette is observed and the delivery time is considered to be complete when the meniscus come to rest slightly above the end of the delivery tube. The capacity of the pipette is then calculated with the aid of the available data. At least two determinations should be made. Similarly, curate should be calculated. If it is necessary, it is essential to establish that it is satisfactory with regard to leakage and delivery time before undertaking the actual calibration process as done for pipette. So the table one gives the volume of one gram of water at various temperature and from here by taking temperature and volume the pipette and burette and other glass operator may be calibrated. So overall I can say that Calibration in measurement technology is the comparison of measurement value delivered by a species under test with those of a calibration standard of known accuracy. Such a standard could be another measurement device of known accuracy, a device generating the quantity to be measured such as voltage or a physical artifact such as a meter ruler. The outcome of the comparison can result in no significant error being noted in on the device under test, a significant, a significant error being noted but no adjustment made or an adjustment made to correct the error to an acceptable level. Strictly speaking, the term calibration means just the act of comparison and does not include any subsequent adjustments. Thank you.